Okay. Uh, this is the second part of the, the presentation uh, for today. And uh, as I have said, it, it, it will uh, deal with the uh, CT of the chest. And uh, the aim of this talk is uh, to uh, let you know how to look at the, the CT scan of the chest in uh, a simple way. And how can you identify the uh, anatomy as well as the uh, some of the pathological features. I will start by the indications for CT scan of the chest, and they are a lot. But the most important indication is to assess an equivocal bleeding straight line. As you have said from the first talk, there are a lot of conditions that you need the help of CT in order to identify the margin of the lesion, in order to see the content of the lesion, in order to confirm the presence of calcium, and so this is one of the main roles of the uh, CT in the chest is to confirm or to uh, assess the equivocal plain X-ray finds. And uh, of course, it has many tasks in the, in the uh, evaluation of the chest concerning the lung neoplasm and extra thoracic malignancies, assessment of diffuse lung disease, uh, chest wall and the mediastinum, but one of the important issues is the evaluation of suspected pulmonary embolism. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the role of CT nowadays. CT is considered the first choice. Whenever you are suspecting pulmonary embolism, this is the first line of investigation in assessment of pulmonary embolism, as I will uh, show to you in a moment. And in order to do a CT scan of the chest, you put the patient on the uh, CT machine and it should have a, a, what's known as the scanogram. The scanogram is just a blade X-ray or a scout view for the area to be examined. In order to locate the range of examination, we will start from the apex of the lung until we finish by the cot training end. Then if you ask the CT scan to do sections from here to there, the CT will ask you on the screen what is the thickness or the interval of the, of the slices. Uh, would you like to have the slices every one centimeter or half a centimeter or three millimeter or what's it, what else? And we usually scan the chest every one centimeter from the apex of the lung until we reach the cost of the gain. Then uh, after uh, having the section, we should uh, uh, image every section in two ways, as you can see. This image is known as the mediastinal window, and this one is known as the lung window. Here you can see the mediastinal structures, but you can see the details of the lung. Here you can see the details of the lung, and you cannot see the details of the mediastinum. Then every section in the, in the chest should be uh, uh, imaged in two ways, the mediastinal window and the lung window. And if we have a, one of the recent machines, we can order the machine to reconstruct these transverse sections into a vertical section. And the vertical sections may be in the coronal plane or in the sagittal plane, as you can see. And this is nowadays is uh, available, and it takes no time at all to perform these reconstructed images, which are very helpful in the uh, diagnosis of the intrathoracic pathology. Actually, if the patient is going to be injected contrast material intravenously, the patient should fast for about four to six hours. But not every case we uh, uh, inject the contrast material. We usually inject the contrast material if we are concerned about the media sign. But if the, the, our interest is in the lung field, we do not need to inject the contrast material. Uh, when we are not interested in the mediastinum, like in the evaluation of diffuse lung disease, assessment of bronchiectasis, searching for lung deposits, and in some cases of trauma. Uh, this this uh, examination is known as the bronchogram, and it is now an obsolete technique, is no more used in the clinical practice. We inject a lot of contrast material in the bronchial tree, as you can see, and, and we, we do not usually do this examination nowadays. But CT is one of the most important uh, tools to assess the, the presence of bronchiectasis. Now I'll, I'll give you a hint about the development of CT. 
This is the CT scan and is composed of a big box which is known as the gantry and the bed where the patient lies. If you open this, this box and you can see a lot of machines inside. What's important for us is the X-ray tube and the detector which is the imager or the camera. And the patient is usually lies or lying with the, in between the, the X-ray tube and the detector. In order to have a section in the human body, the X-ray tube and the detector should uh, Then uh, okay. okay. Can you can you can you hear it? that uh, whenever you, you, you would like to have a section in the human body, the X-ray tube and the detector should rotate a full cycle around the, the human body. But this was not feasible in the older machines because the, this X-ray tube is connected to the ground or to the wall by electricity cab cables. Then the tube has to rotate half cycle and it goes back to barking, then rotate the other cycle and goes back to barking. This means that in order to have a single section in the chest or in any part of the body, the, the tube and the detector have to move four times. And at that time, the CT scan of the chest was performed in a full hour, in 60 minutes. Then after that, the new machine, which is known as the Spirit CT, has developed. In this machine, the X-ray tube can rotate without stoppage. The electricity reaches the tube without cables. Then the, the tube rotates continuously, and the bed where the patient lie also moves continuously during the tube rotation. Then the, the tube is rotating, and the bed is moving, and you got the spiral. And uh, by this uh, uh, marvelous development, the CT scan of the chest was performed in about 12 minutes. And uh, after that, we, uh, we have this uh, uh, peculiar machine, which is known as the multi-slice or the multi-detector CT. In the spiral CT, you have an X-ray tube and a detector. And by every rotation, you got a section. Every rotation, you got a section. Then what happens if we put in front of the X-ray tube more than one detector? 
let's just say four. Then every every tube rotation you got four sections. Every tube rotation you got four sections. Then if you uh, do the spiral, the CT scan of the chest by the spiral CT in 12 minutes, you will uh, have only three minutes to perform a CT scan of the chest using a four detector uh, CT. And after the uh, increase in the uh, detectors in front of the X-ray tube, the, the, there was a marked progression in this field. And the, the tube, the number of the detectors have been raised from four to six to eight to 10 to 16 to 32, then 46. And uh, at, by the, 40, the 64, the 64 machine, you have 64 detectors in front of the X-ray tube. Then every rotation, you got four, uh, 64 sections, and you can finish the chest in a second or two seconds at, uh, uh, at maximum. Then by, by increasing the number of the detectors in front of the X-ray tube, we can have a very fast machine. And nowadays, we have uh, the, the CT scan with uh, 128 uh, detectors and 256 detectors and 320 detectors and uh, the latest machine is 640 uh, detectors in front of the X-ray tube. Then you can imagine the, the market speed of the machine. And by this speed, we are able to do these four important facilities. Number one, we have the very rapid scanning, and this is good in, in patient overload. Whenever you have too many patients and you have a, a very long waiting list, and you can finish the examination at a, a very short time. And uh, I remember by the first machine, the first machine, we used to do 40 patients starting from 8 in the morning until 12 in the, in the, in the night. Then uh, by, by this multi-detector uh, machine, we can finish these 40 patients in only two hours. Then you can imagine how, how fast this machine. Number two is the vascular imaging. And this is a very, very important application. These CT machines, you can, you can inject the patient with contrast intravenously. Then you tell the machine, I want to see the vessel, say any vessel in the human body. And this machine is programmed for every particular vessel, artery or vein. And you inject the contrast material, the machine is programmed to scan the patient whenever the contrast reaches the particular vessel you want. Then you can see the vessel without the need of any catheterization. And this is applicable for any vessel in the human body, whatever it is, artery or vein. Also, you can do the vertical reconstruction and you can reconstruct the images in the corona and in the sagittal plane. And this virtual endoscopy, you can go through any tube in the human body, the colon, the bronchus, the vessel, the ureter, the cochlea, any tube in the human body using this virtual technique, uh, simulating the real endoscopy. And uh, uh, I think I will talk about this whenever we are uh, 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 talking in the second part, dealing with the uh, radiology of the abdomen. Then can you imagine that these are CT images? And you inject the contrast material intravenously, and you tell the machine, I would like to see the pulmonary artery. Then the machine scans the uh, chest whenever the contrast material <coughs> reaches the pulmonary artery, and you reconstruct the image in the coronal bilin, then you can see the pulmonary artery and its branches, and you can see minute emboli in the dist very distant branches. This is the best way for diagnosis of pulmonary embolism nowadays. This scan does not take more than two seconds to reach these images. And you can display the images in black and white and also in colors, as you can see. This is an example of a pulmonary embolism. This is the patent vessel, and this is the a thrombosed vessel, and you can see the infarcted area in the lung. And the machine also has the ability to remove any undesired structure in the image. Now you are concerned with the pulmonary artery and the branches, and you don't need to see the lung, you don't need to see the chest, you don't chest wall, the ribs, the spine. Any structure you don't want to see, you can remove it from the image. 
then you are left with the pulmonary uh, vascularity and you can see the branches all through and clear of any overlapping shadows. And the coronary vessel, you all know that this is one of the major techniques nowadays and it, it has been replaced almost totally cardiac catheterization for diagnostic purposes. And he, this is a CT image of the heart and the coronary vessels and you can also remove the cardiac shadow itself leaving the coronary vessels in, in order to evaluate any abnormality. And also you can, you can use this facility in the CT scan to reconstruct the, the vessel from its origin to its termination, just by identifying the vessel on each image. You, let's say, to the, you should say to, this, to the machine, this is the coronary vessel I want, this is the coronary vessel, this is the coronary vessel. Then the machine can reconstruct these dots into a full uh, uh, range of the artery and you, you can see any site of stenosis, uh, for example. This is in uh, a CT angiography of the aorta. You inject the contrast intravenously, tell the machine to scan the, aor the, scan the aorta whenever the contrast reaches the aorta, then you can see the ascending, the arch, the descending, aneurysm in the abdominal aorta, arteriosclerotic changes, and these images can be obtained in less than two seconds. And you can see the aneurysm in front, you can, you can have the, the image on the lateral view to see the anterior and the posterior aspects of the aneurysm, and you can display the image in colors. Also, the circulation of the lower limbs. You can inject the contrast intravenously and uh, scan the lower limbs for the circulation. Then you can remove the bones, you can remove the muscles, and you are left with the femoral artery and the branches. This is an example of occlusion of the femoral artery, and this is an example of patent lower limb circulation. This uh, technique of selective femoral angiography was uh, 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 actually very difficult and it needs a long time or a lot of time uh, to call for the radiologist or the interventional radiologist and to call for the uh, doctor of anesthesia and so in order to perform this, uh, this angiogram to see the patency of the femoral artery in the case of femoral uh, fractures. But whenever this machine is available in the emergency room and you can, you can uh, scan the patient in only two seconds or so, and you can have a full idea about the lower limb circulation. And then this is a CT image, and you inject the contrast in intravenously, and you scan the side, then you remove the muscles, and you remove all the structures, you are left with the femur and the vessels. This is the common femoral artery, this is the profunda femoris, and then this is the superficial femoral, which is included here, down to there. And you can display in color, as you can see. Also, you can also see the mesenteric circulation by injecting a few uh, milliliters of contrast material intravenously, and uh, uh, you can see the superior mesenteric artery and the branches of the aorta. And uh, this scan was done in nine seconds using a foreign channel machine. And if you have a, a, a more uh, higher machine, like 16 channel or 32 channel, and you can markedly reduce this, uh, this time. Then, uh, how to look to the CT scan of the chest? We have two images, and the, the first one is known as the mediastinal window, and the second one is known as the lung window. In the mediastinal window, we should know the mediastinal structures. In the lung window, we should know the lobes of the lung. Here, we, in the mediastinal window, we have an anatomic landmark, and also in the lung window, we have an anatomic landmark. The anatomic landmark in the mediastinal window is the arch of the aorta. And the arch of the aorta uh, is usually termed by the chest physicians as the banana, because it is usually almost similar to the banana. Then, if you look to this image, and you can see this is the arch of the aorta, and adjacent to it is the superior vena cava. Then, in the scan, you can see this uh, this structure, which represents the superior vena cava. Then, to start to start uh, interpreting the CT scan of the chest, you should put your finger first on the arch of the aorta. Then you know, adjacent to the arch of the aorta, nothing but the superior vena cava. And this is the anatomy here. The trachea and the esophagus will be examined in the lung window because they usually contain air. Then if you see the banana or the arch of the aorta and you identify the superior vena cava, what is the anatomy above and what is the anatomy below? 
Above the arch of the aorta, you will see the branches coming out from the arch of the aorta, and these are three. The uh, left common carotid, the, the uh, left, uh, left subclavian, left common carotid, and the innominate artery. And these vessels are aligned in the same way the arch of the aorta is aligned. And you can see three major branches coming out from the arch of the aorta. Then you can also see the left innominate vein crossing the midline to join the right innominate vein to form the superior vena cava later on. And this is the, the innominate vein, the left innominate vein will join this right innominate vein to form the superior vena cava later on. Then if you go more up, you, you will see the same anatomy. These are the branches of the arch of the aorta, left subclavian, left common carotid, and the innominate uh, artery. And this is the left innominate vein, this is the right innominate vein. Then the left innominate vein crosses the midline to join the right one, then they form the superior vena cava. And this is the anatomy from the level of the aortic arch and up to the lung apex. Then if you go down from the aortic arch, you are cutting here, this is the arch of the aorta, and this is the superior vena cava. Lower down, you will see that the arch will divide into ascending aorta and the descending aorta. And here, this is the ascending aorta, and this is the descending aorta, and this is the superior vena cava. Lower down, you will see the arch, the arch, the ascending aorta, and the descending aorta with the space in between, which is the space for the pulmonary artery. Here is the arch of the aorta, and this uh, acid. This is the ascending aorta and descending aorta, the superior vena cava, and this is the pulmonary artery, which is almost similar to the figure of eight in Arabic. This is the pulmonary main trunk, and this is the left branch, and this is the right branch. Then lower down, you can have the same anatomy, superior vena cava, ascending aorta, descending aorta, pulmonary artery, right main branch. Then in this image, you can see this is the ascend, ascending aorta, descending aorta, and then this region where the pulmonary artery will appear. This is the severe vena cava. Then lower down, you can see the pulmonary artery, its uh, left branch and its right branch. This is the ascending aorta and the descending aorta, and this is the severe vena cava. Then the same anatomy here, this is the pulmonary artery, this is the ascending aorta, descending aorta, superior vena cava. Each of these vessels will enter a specific cardiac chamber. Then we start by the superior vena cava, which will enter the right atrium. This is the superior vena cava, and this is the beginning of the right atrium. And this is the superior vena cava, this is the right atrium. And the superior vena cava has entered the right atrium. Then the pulmonary artery will enter the right ventricle. This is the pulmonary artery, this is the pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery entering the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery in the right ventricle. This is the right ventricle, and this is the right atrium. Then the ascending aorta will enter the left ventricle. This is the ascending aorta, this is the ascending aorta, and this is the ascending aorta, and this is the ascending aorta, and this is the left ventricle. This is the left ventricle, this is the right ventricle, this is the right atrium, and this is the left atrium. Then, if you, if you came to this image, this is the right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. This is the descending aorta, and this is the site of the esophagus. Lower down, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Lower down, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Lower down, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. And this is the site of entrance of the inferior vena cava coming from the abdomen into the right atrium. And this is the dome of the liver and the diaphragm. Then you finish with the mediastinal anatomy. Then we came to the lung. The lung, the anatomy of the lung, the, the landmark here is the trachea. You are cutting, if you are cutting in the trachea, you are cutting in the upper loop. If the trachea uh, is divided, then the anatomy will change. Look at this section. Can you see the trachea? Then this is the upper loop. And every image in the radiology is the patient looking to the physician. Then this is the left side of the patient, and this is the right side of the patient. This is the left upper loop, and this is the, the right upper loop. OK, then look at this section. Can you see the trachea? Yes, you can see the trachea. Then this is the left upper loop, and this is the right upper loop. OK, what happens if the trachea has divided into two main bronchi? Look at the section, and you are cutting here at the hilum. At the hilum, you still see part of the upper loop 
and posteriorly you can see part of the lower loop. Then whenever the trachea divides, the section is divided. The anterior part belongs to the upper loop, the posterior part belongs to the lower loop. Whenever you see the trachea, you are cutting in the upper loop. Whenever the trachea bifurcates, then the loop, the, the, the section is also divided into two parts. The anterior part is for the upper loop and the posterior part is for the lower loop. Then, if you see the tracheal bifurcation, this is the upper loop, this is the lower loop, this is the upper loop, this is the lower loop. And the, the upper half, the anterior half is for the upper loop, the posterior half is for the lower loop. Then, if you go more down, you are cutting in the cardiac shadow. No trachea, no bronchi. And you are cutting here. Here on the left, you are cutting in the lingula and the lower loop. On the right side, you are cutting in the middle loop and the lower loop. The lingula or the middle loop corresponds to one third of the thoracic diameter. The diameter of the thorax from here to there, then the diameter of the lower loop in this, uh, of the middle loop, this particular area. Then if we came to the CT section, we can draw a line separating the anterior third from the posterior two thirds. The anterior third on the left side is the lingula. The anterior third on the right side is the middle loop. The posterior thirds on the left and right are belonging to the lower loop. Then let us make some tests. We have three levels. The first level is the level of the trachea. The second one is the level of the carina. The third one is the level of the cardiac shadow. Whenever you see the carina, whenever the trachea is divided, the section is also divided. Then you know that this part represents left upper loop. And this part, right lower loop. Then can you see this fissure? And it's almost exactly at the side of the line I draw. Then this fissure separates an anterior third from the posterior two thirds at the level of the cardiac shadow. Then this area represents the middle loop, and this area the lingula, and this one right lower loop, and this one left lower loop, and this one lower loop, and also this is the right lower loop. Also. Then. This patient had a mnemonic consolidation with air bronchograph. Can you say where is this consolidation? Left upper loop. Okay, the trachea bifurcates, then this is the upper loop, and this is the lower loop, this is the left upper loop. These are bronchiectatic changes. Where? Right lower loop. Very good. These are mnemonic consolidation. This is Mnemonic consolidation. Lingula. Okay, lingula, because this is the cardiac shadow, anterior third lingula, anterior third middle loop. This is the nematocele. Right, lower loop. And you see the tracheal bifurcation, anteriorly the upper, posteriorly the lower. This is the left and this is the right. Right, lower loop. And this is the bronchogenic carcinoma. Left upper loop. You see the trachea? Yes, then you are cutting in the upper loop. This is the left side and this is the right side. Okay. And these are metastatic deposits. This is one, second, third. And these metastases are located in both lower loops. Yes, this is the lingula and this is the middle loop, and the metastases are located in both lower loops. This patient had TB infiltration and abscesses. These infiltrations are seen in the lingula, and this abscess is seen in the yes, right lower lobe. Then we came back to the mediastinal anatomy. Do you remember this very famous structure? Yes, this is the arch of the aorta, and this is the superior vena cava. Okay. Then this patient had the post radiation it changes in the lung. We can see after mastectomy. Where is this radiation it changes? You see the tracheal bifurcation, then you divide the section into two halves. This is the upper loop, this is the lower loop, and this is the right upper loop. Post radiation it changes. Then we came back more to the mediastinal anatomy. Yes, pulmonary main trunk. Ascending aorta. Okay, what do you think of this? Superior vena cava? 
ascending aorta descending aorta left main pulmonary left pulmonary artery very good طيب what do you think the site of this bronchogenic carcinoma the trachea is bifurcated here and uh, then the, this is the upper lobe and this is the lobe. this is the left lower lobe whenever the trachea divides the section is divided this patient had pulmonary embolies and three infarctions where is these two infarcts in the lingula and this one in the lower lobe yes and this is two infarcts in the in the lingula and this one is in the lower lobe then what do you think of this cardiac chamber right atrium and this one left atrium and this is the esophagus and this is the sending award then what do you think of this arch of the award and this one superior vena cave yes very good okay and i thank you very much